Um, being mic'd at the moment is Erin O'Hara, also from Vanderbilt. She's the uh, director of the Law and Human Behavior Program there, Professor of Law, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs. And uh, as you can read, as well as I, her primary research are involved conciliation. So in a conciliatory mood, Erin O'Hara. Well, let me um, first uh, echo the thanks of the group, Roger, and bringing us all together for this conversation. Um, I've learned a lot. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit um, odd on this panel, as it turns out, because while I do want to talk about neuroscience and the law, um, my primary focus is uh, not aimed at criminal law, although if I get a chance, I'll try to um, uh, take some of these ideas and apply them in the criminal context. Um, I'd like to talk to you about uh, the relationship between interpersonal trust and the law. So if you think about the law uh, regulating conduct in a variety of areas, often the law's regulations are having an effect or influence on interpersonal relationships. Um, and they could be interpersonal relationships of any sort, um, buyers and sellers in a marketplace, uh, employers and employees, doctors and patients, family members, et cetera. Um, sometimes a legal rule or regulation has the intent of affecting trust uh, in that relationship. So one justification for interspousal immunity laws is to protect the sanctity of the trust in a marital relationship and not force one spouse or even sometimes permit one spouse to sue the other spouse or testify against the other spouse in court. Um, conspiracy laws and the way that we deal with criminal policy involving conspiracy uh, sort of all s center on attempting to break trust in uh, organized crime relationships. Um, but there are other times when legal rules influence interpersonal trust um, unintentionally. That is, the point of the legal rule is to provide information to the public or to provide information to the government for policy making, as is uh, the case with disclosure rules, um, or to provide compensation for injured individuals, as the case for liability rules. And yet, those rules, too, can influence the uh, trust uh, that forms in interpersonal relationships. And so because legal rules can influence trust, legal scholars and legal policymakers are quick to make claims, lots of different types of claims, about how a proposed legal rule or legal policy might uh, influence trust, uh, interpersonal trust uh, in relationships. The um, problem uh, up until about 10 years ago is that we knew relatively little about how trust relationships form, how they are maintained, and how they can erode. Um, social psychologists have been at the issue of trust for a long time, but one of the problems with social psychology is that the theories uh, of interpersonal trust would often contradict one another. So from a policymaking perspective, it wasn't clear what to make of the work that was being done. And along came experimental economists, and they developed this trust game. Um, and we've had you know, some reference uh, uh, to this research uh, so far, but just to make clear the way the trust game works, uh, you'd have two players. Player one is given a dollar, um, any amount of money, but let's say a dollar. Um, player one can either put the dollar in the pocket and be done, or player one can take that dollar and give it over to player two. If player one chooses to share the dollar with, uh, to give the dollar to player two, um, typically that dollar's tripled, so one dollar becomes three dollars. Three dollars is given to player two. And then player two decides whether to take the three dollars and put it in the pocket um, or to share it with player one. Okay, and there are variants on the game, but let's suppose the sharing here means each gets a dollar, a dollar fifty. Okay, so if player one trusts or decides to cooperate in the game by giving the dollar over to player two, player one could get a dollar fifty back and be better off. But if player two um, can just pocket the three dollars, uh, then player one might get nothing at all. Okay, from a game theory perspective, one might, uh, economists used to predict that um, player two would pocket the three dollars, there being no loss if you're playing with strangers across computers, which is typically the case uh, in the trust game. There being no loss to keeping the three dollars, you're much better off with three than a dollar fifty. Of course, player two is going to keep the three dollars, and knowing this is the obvious result. Player ones would keep their one dollar in the first place and not want to cooperate. And so what the economists um, found in these experimental games was, of course, people, co people cooperate um, much more often uh, than the game theory would have predicted. Uh, but they also found uh, uh, that trust uh, in, in this context, or what they're calling trust, the willingness to cooperate, um, to give the dollar over uh, for potential gains. Um, that, uh, that trust was very fragile. That is, it was very, um, it could be broken down very quickly uh, with the lack uh, of player, player two deciding not to give back or share back with player one. Um, and that once the trust uh, eroded as a consequence of a failure to return the cooperation, 
uh, to behave in a trustworthy fashion, uh, it was hard to rebuild the trust. Okay, so legal policy makers and legal scholars grabbed this experimental research, right, and, and started arguing um, this shows we shouldn't have regulation in a particular context, right? We shouldn't have regulation because it turns out people cooperate more than the game theory predicted, so we, maybe we don't need regulation. And if we impose regulation, that can negatively influence trust and relationships because the experiments show trust is fragile. Okay, now I'm not a huge fan of regulation, but this is too simple a story, right? Um, the experimental economics games are fascinating and they have the potential to teach us a lot. But at, this, at, at that point in time, all we have are games between strangers um, and very short-term games. But the interpersonal trusts and relationships that are out there in the world that the law works on are very different types of relationships. Maybe those relationships form differently, maybe trust arose differently, et cetera. Okay. So uh, neuroeconomists made an, av an advancement on this. They said, okay, let's take the trust game, but have it iterate over several periods. Okay, let's have individuals play with one another over several periods, starting as strangers, playing over computers, uh, but let's see what happens uh, over a longer period of time. And sure enough, once these trust relationships build, the decision by player one to turn over that dollar seems to occur a lot faster over time. Um, and interestingly, activity in the caudate nucleus uh, of the brain tends to fall off over time. Now, the caudate nucleus is, um, uh, uh, seems to be involved in processing feedback information that helps uh, an individual assess what to do with regard to future decisions. So the implication here is that over a period of time, when trust builds up, subjects are paying, individuals are paying a lot less attention to how the other is behaving and making their decisions about whether to pay over based on this sort of attitudinal or affective view of whether the other person's a good person or a bad person. That suggests maybe trust is a little more resilient uh, than initially thought with the experimental trust games. We don't know enough yet to decide with regard to legal policies and legal policies in particular contexts, but it's a step, it's a step down the path. In prior work, though, I've made the argument, um, just based on intuition, that trust relationships across, uh, trust relationships form in very different ways depending on the type of relationship you're talking about. If you're talking about strangers coming together as buyer or seller or contracting party, they start as strangers and they develop a little information about one another and they take small trust steps, but you know, that sort of builds up into sort of larger, richer relationships over time. But if you look at romantic relationships, or if you look at doctor-patient relationships, those are two situations where it seems as though individuals are um, deciding to trust another, sort of developing high trust very quickly and with very little information. Um, and those types of relationships are relationships where the trust seems highly resilient, harder to break down. Um, and in fact, in the domestic violence context, you know, one of the things the law has to deal with is what do we do with abused spouses who are willing to go back into relationships that outside observers say they shouldn't be back in, um, you know, how, if at all, should the law uh, influence that particular situation? So if you think of those relationships as, high, if you think of certain relationships as high trust relationships, trust forms quickly, may be more resilient, um, we're, we, we, we don't know anything from the experimental economics games that can tell us about those particular relationships or at least that was the, the view, my view, a couple of years ago. But, um, ex but the uh, neuroeconomists are sticking with the problem. Uh, and so uh, Liz Phelps, uh, in her lab, um, with Bob Frank, who's an, got together with Bob Frank, who's an economist, um, and a grad student, Mauricio Delgado, and they said, what would happen if we primed individuals about their trading partners? So let's take a player one, our subjects are player one, and let's have them believe they're playing with a real player two, but player two is actually fictional. Now, let's tell player one about the background of player two, okay? So subjects are told, um, are given vignettes, one of three vignettes, a hero vignette, something like uh, your playing partner uh, rescued a person out of a build burning building, a villain vignette, um, your playing partner stole something from someone or cheated, uh, and then a morally neutral vignette. You know, your playing partner likes to swim, likes dogs, and uh, likes to go for long walks. Um, and let's see what happens. Well, lo and behold, you probably won't be surprised about this, player one was much more likely to cooperate with this fictional player two when player one heard a hero story. 
relative to the neutral story, and much less likely to cooperate when the player one heard a villain story relative to a neutral story, right? Suggesting that we could prime um, um, uh, behavior uh, with these vignettes ahead of time. But interestingly, player ones continued to cooperate with their hero player twos, even when the computer had the hero player two um, cheat of uh, keep the three dollars um, a surprising amount of time. And even more interestingly, from my perspective, they weren't finding activity in the caudate nucleus, not even from the beginning um, for the hero stories. Um, for, the, for the player ones who thought they were playing with a villain, um, there was less cooperation uh, over time, less willingness to give that dollar over time, even when the computer had the player two when the dollar was given, um, um, give back, giving back uh, to the player one. Um, in here, there's activity in the caudate nucleus uh, on the part of the subject, um, but less activity in the caudate nucleus than when subjects uh, think they're playing with this morally neutral uh, playing partner. Um, so it's suggesting not only do we get behavioral differences based on what we think, we're, who we think we're dealing with, um, but that that part of the brain that would have us update and pay careful attention to the behavior of our playing partner can be circ circumvented uh, if we're given information that kind of has us um, uh, um, um, b believe strongly that the other person should be trusted or not trusted. That kind of experimental game, I think, gets a little bit closer, right? Because if we think of these high trust relationships as ones that are highly or heavily primed, it gets us closer to that particular context. We need to know a lot more, but the idea is that we might, uh, we might be, be able to, with experimental economics coupled with neuroscience, learn a lot more about how these trust relationships work and then do a better job with legal policy. Do, do I still have time? Minute or two. Okay, so if I could, if I could bring, bring it back to criminal law, since that uh, seems to be the um, uh, subject of interest today. If you think about um, what causes people to commit crimes, um, we, we know mental disease and mental disorders uh, are a big factor in criminal conduct. We know addiction is a big factor of criminal conduct. But many individuals commit crimes who don't seem to have a mental uh, disease or disorder. Uh, don't seem to be um, um, addicts, uh, don't seem to have trouble with substance abuse. And so what's going on in these situations? We've, over time, as you've heard, we've over time, we've ramped up criminal penalties until they're pretty high to the point where we would think it's irrational to commit crimes unless you think you're not going to get caught. And then every day we hear stories about people who are committing crimes in context where they're obviously going to get caught or where this, the, the probability is pretty high. What's going on in these circumstances? And, and, and no doubt a piece of it is time orientation. But I think this time orientation might also be related, uh, what the causal effect is, I'm not sure, um, related also to a sense of a person's worldview, right? So from our perspective, you know, if we think in general people will do good things out there, if we think in general there's a relationship between our effort and outcomes, if we think in general that it's a, ju it's a just world, it's irrational to commit crimes. But suppose you're an individual whose worldview is that in general people are lousy, they'll cheat you at every possible second, that there's no relationship between your effort and the outcome. Why not engage in criminal conduct? <clears throat> Unlikely to lead to good results, but what is likely to lead good, to good results? <clears throat> so the question is, can we go back to the trust game? Excuse me, I'm losing my voice here. <clears throat> can we go back to the trust game? And can we think of worldviews as having this priming effect, right? So that subjects who have a very strong, a very positive worldview are individuals who think they're playing with heroes, you know, act as though they're playing with heroes all the time um, out there in the world. And people who have very strong negative worldviews um, act as though they're playing with villains all the time. And so uh, there's a group of us neuroscientists and, and lawyers who have gotten together to embark on a project where um, we are uh, hoping to get um, behavioral data um, on worldview, the influence of worldview uh, in the trust game, uh, and then try to link that up to the neuroscience research to get a better sense of um, how our perspectives on the world in general cause us to uh, behave or interact with others. And if we get the results we're hoping to get, that could have implications for how we deal with criminal policy making in a number of, le number of levels. First, how to try to prevent crime in the first place, then how do we deal with uh, criminals who, you know, I love my favorite story, um, Morris Hoffman, who's a judge in Colorado, says, you know, this is not atypical, but I'm just going to give you one example of how ridiculous criminals can be. I told this one guy he could have probation instead of going to jail for five years. I told him specifically, if you do not go across the street and sign up for probation and do what the probation officer tells you to do, 
you will go to jail for five years. That guy did not walk across the street and put his name on a piece of paper. And he ended up going, having to go to jail for five years. Um, so, um, so it may be that we, if, if worldview is influencing criminal behavior, it's probably also influencing our efforts to try to rehabilitate, de deal with criminal behavior, and so probably policy implications uh, with regard to how we process and how we punish and how we deal with rehabilitation more generally. Um, and, then f and then finally, of course, more specifically, how do we deal with juvenile justice uh, with, with young individuals who are begin beginning to have uh, views about the world in general, and they're also beginning to make really poor choices. How does that, how do we deal with that particular interaction and do a better job from the policy perspective? Mm -hmm. Thank you.